Hello my friends, welcome to my corner. I would like to share with you 12 brilliant novellas written by women. This video is a continuation, in a sense, of my 12 classic novellas everyone should read video. And as I said in that video, I love novellas. I don't think they are simply long short stories or shorter novels. And I also like the number 12 because it gives you one year of novellas. And I realized as I was putting together that other video that many of my favorite novellas were written by women. So I thought that would be a very good excuse to put together a video that focuses exclusively on women's literature and women authors writing novellas. The novellas that you're about to see were published throughout the world, many, many different countries, from 1859 to 2008. So we have virtually one century and a half of novellas. And we're going to start our journey in England, because the first one that I have for you, and these are in chronological order, okay, uh, is The Lifted Veil by George Eliot, one of the underrated masterpieces of the novella. In this novella, what we have is an extraordinary situation, because we have a character who can see future events. Latimer, this is the name of the character, is described as weak. He's a, he's a weakling. Right? And uh, this, from the very beginning, tells you that we are dealing with an anti-epic here, because we have an anti-hero in Latimer. And as I often say, the novella is really the anti-epic. If you have the long novel, the epic novel, the you know other side to that would be the novella. We have literary ambiguity in this novella, because we don't really know whether Latimer can actually see future events, or if he is just insane. You know, that is a possibility here, at least at the beginning of the story, while you begin to read it. And he is the narrator, so all we have to go by really is his word. You know, we don't really know anything else outside of what he is telling us. This, as you can tell already, is in sharp contrast to the objective realism of Middlemarch, which is the great novel that George Eliot is primarily known for, and the one that everybody reads. But this is also a story of a love triangle. It is a story of a conflict among brothers also. And at one point in the story, you also have to add a medical experiment, a very interesting one, to the mix. So we have quite an interesting mix going on here in the lifted veil. The protagonist is male, okay, Latimer, right? But we also have a fascinating figure in Bertha, who is the, the important female character here. She is really sadistic. I mean, it, it's incredible. Look out for an episode with an opal ring. Okay, I think that episode with the opal ring really summarizes her personality for us. It is a rather misanthropic text, to be honest with you. It is pretty dark, but it is also full of insight, psychological insight especially. So that's one of the many reasons why I like the lifted veil. For number two, we're going to travel to France. Because number two is The Cat by Colette. I first read it in this edition that also has Gigi uh, with it. But there's also one edition that has, uh, you know, only The Cat. So you're going to see that many times the novella, they are texts that were part of an other, you know, another collection, but they were also um, published separately. And this is the case with The Cat. Um, here we have a story, uh, also a story of a love triangle, but with a twist, okay? Because we have a male character, Alain, a female character, Camille, and the third person, in the love triangle is actually a cat named uh, Saha. Saha is a Russian blue, so she looks very much like this cat that I'm showing you right here. And at its most basic level, the cat is a story of jealousy. Okay, it's an exploration of the concept of jealousy. And as in many novellas, nothing can be said to actually happen. Okay, what we have is a series of events, right? that point to or that illuminate something that is much deeper than what is evident. This is typical of the novella. And the descriptions are simply amazing in The Cat. They, they are so uh, vivid, right? Lots of sensory description, but not only when it comes to like visuals, there's also a lot of description of smells, for instance. So that's something to look out for in uh, The Cat. It was adapted to film 
by Roberto Rossellini for a collective film on the seven deadly sins. Unfortunately, I was not able to find a copy of this, so I cannot tell you whether the film is any good or not. But I like the idea, right? You have the seven deadly sins, so these are going to be short films. So it's probably the best way to adapt a novella. And guess which one of the seven deadly sins was, is illustrated by this little film? Of course, it's Envy, right? Because that is really what we have right here. A story of jealousy, a story of envy. If somebody asked me, okay, can you describe uh, the cat for me? I would say it is a refreshing mix of the familiar and the unexpected. Because you have something as familiar as a love triangle on the one hand, and then something as unexpected as one of the people, quote unquote, involved in the love triangle being a cat. So I think that is a good way to describe uh, Colette's novella, The Cat. For number three, we're going to travel to a very different place, because we're going to go to Chile. Number three is The Final Mist, La Ultima Niebla, by Maria Luisa Bombal. This is a story of newlyweds, okay? Uh, the unnamed protagonist has just married her cousin, Daniel, whose first wife died a few months ago. So we have a situation that is already quite, you know, uh, difficult for everybody right there. And the first image is this. They arrive at, at, at the house and the roof is leaking. So how's that for an omen, right? That's not the kind of thing that you want. Uh, I think in the second page, they start discussing the marriage. They ask, one of the characters asks uh, the other, why did we get married? And the other character replies, because. So we have something very, very strange going on, a very weird situation. Uh, a situation in which the wife must imitate a previous wife. So something akin to what you see in Hitchcock's Vertigo, right? You have the second woman trying to take the place of the first one. And in this case, in the case of La Ultima Niebla, the uh, narrator and the protagonist, she doesn't feel well uh, at all with this situation. She feels stifled, she feels the need to get out, and the story proper actually gets started when she meets unexpectedly a mysterious man. That's when we actually start to see some things, you know, actually happening in the novella. This is a story of longing, it's a story of great sensuality, right? Uh, and of striking eroticism, really. And it's a story that, as T.S. Eliot put it, it really mixes memory and desire. What you have here are those two currents working uh, to, to compose this text. It's a story that really hinges on ambiguity. So that is something to keep in mind. It, you're you're going to want to reread it as soon as you're done reading it. And it's beautifully understated. It's very, very brief. Okay, uh, actually, this is probably one of the hard sells of this list right here, because many people might tell you, I don't think it's a novella. I think it's more of a short story. I think it's a novella, but it's a very, very short novella, one of the shortest that I've read. If you want to compare the novella and the novel as genres, there is something very interesting that you can do, because Maria Luisa Bombal also published a novel titled House of Mist, and that's the actual title because she wrote it in English while she was living in the US. Technically, it's the same story as La Ultima Niebla, or The Final Mist. One is a novel, the other one is a novella. So one really, you know, suggests, the other one really spells things out for you. So if you read House of Mist, the novel, and La Ultima Niebla, or The Final Mist, the novella, you're really going to get some great insight into the differences between the novel and the novella as genres. Let's go to number four now, and I'm going to tell you what this story is about. This story explores the complex bond between a six-foot-tall cross-eyed woman and a four-foot-tall hunchbacked man. If I tell you the story takes place in the U.S. South, you can probably guess who wrote it. I am talking, of course, of Carson McCullers. And for number four, I have for you The Ballad of the Sad Café, which is included in her collected uh, short stories. Collected stories, actually. So, Carson McCullers. This is a very interesting story, The Ballad of the Sad Café, um, about an extraordinary woman but it is also about the mentality of a small town. If you want, you know, a story that explores the mentality of a small town, this is probably one of the best examples that I know of. The small town, in this case, is a character in itself. We have a collective character, really. 
And Miss Amelia, the female protagonist of the story, is uh, she is fascinating, really. She is um, a storekeeper. She's like really tough, a really tough woman. And she is a doctor slash healer who cannot heal or cure female ailments. So look at this situation here. It's, it's very, very strange for her. And uh, that is part of what defines her as a character. She was married once for 10 days. So think about that. Think about the setting here. I think, you know, Carson McCullers is one of my favorite authors because of the, you know, how, how she sets up the, the story for us. In this story, in The Ballad of the Sad Cafe, things get really interesting when her ex-husband shows up. So we expect a confrontation. I mean, this there's going to be a meeting between the two of them, but nothing, and I mean nothing, can prepare you for what actually happens in the story. It's something that you have to experience for yourself. Look out for the narrator's reflections on love. These are probably the most important statements um, that Carson McCullers made on, on love, and they are a key to understanding her whole work. I believe. So she included those here in the uh, the ballad of the Sad Cafe. And then that final passage, there's a final vignette to this story. It's just really, really something else. It's something to experience. The story was adapted to the stage by Edward Albee, you know, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. Um, and, and that adaptation also resulted in a movie um, directed by Simon Callow. The movie is really good. Okay, for once we have a very good adaptation of a novella. The angles are, are very interesting in this film. I really like that aspect of it. And also the idea that the whole movie was based on photographs from the Depression era. So something to look out for when it comes to the ballad of the sad cafe. Let's go to number five. Number five, we're going to go to Finland because I have for you Tove Jansson's The Summer Book. In this story, a girl named Sofia spends the summer with her grandmother in an island in the Gulf of Finland. And this is told to us basically in 21 vignettes. You could read these vignettes as separate stories. They are complete in themselves. But when you put them together, you know, you get this mosaic of a relationship. Um, if you ask me, okay, describe the summer book in one word, I would say this is an endearing story. It's an endearing novella. The descriptions of nature are simply perfect. Okay, it's such a visual text, you're going to see that. And this is hardly surprising because Tove Jansson was actually an artist, a visual artist. So it's really, you know, she's in her element here with the descriptions. And one thing that I wanted to mention is that this is also a very spiritual book. Because many of the conversations that Sophia has with her grandmother are about God, about spirituality. So I really liked that dimension that you may not find in other novellas that is definitely present here in the summer book. My favorite vignette is the one titled The Cat, uh, for obvious reasons, because I love cats, but there are others that are really, really good too. There's one titled Sophia's Storm, and this one is about the connection between prayer and guilt really nice uh, thing to explore right there. And then there's another vignette titled Day of Danger, which is about superstition. So those three, the cat, Sophia, Storm, and Day of Danger, those would be my favorites uh, if you want to look them up. For more on the novella versus novel issue, there's something else that you can do here. You can read the summer book back to back with Tove Jansson's novel, The True Deceiver. They're both almost equal in length, but one of them is a novel, the True Deceiver, and the other one, The Summer Book, is a novella. So you'll get the contrast right there between the two genres. There's also a video that I made on The True Deceiver, so if you're interested in that, uh, you're welcome to check out my video. Let's go to uh, number six. Number six is going to be a uh, very nice, probably one of my favorites of this list that I'm sharing with you. We're going to travel to Brazil. Of course we're gonna to go to Brazil. You didn't think I was gonna leave her out, right? I am talking about Clarice Lispector, The Hour of the Star, okay, from 1977. This is her last text, uh, her posthumous novella. And this novella has 13 titles. The Hour of the Star is just one of them. And one very interesting thing that you can do as you read it is to try to figure out where the other titles fit in with the story. It's a, you know, a really nice thing to do. We have here a double story. This is something that happens in many novellas. You have a double story. We have on the one hand the story of the poor typist Maccabea, 
But on the other hand, we have the story of Rodrigo S. M., who is the writer and narrator of the story. He says he feels an obligation to tell Maccabea's story. So we have those two things going on right here. The Hour of the Star is really metafiction. It is an ars poetica, even. So you have really here an act of creation and the meditation on that very act in the same place, in the same text. This is really a self-reflexive text. It's also a really quotable text. You may have uh, read somewhere the quote uh, by Clarice Lispector, I only achieve simplicity through great effort, or something like that. I'm paraphrasing here. This is the text where that uh, quote comes from. And there are many, many others. At one point, she says something like, um, as long as I have questions that I cannot answer, I'm going to continue to write. Many, many places that you can quote with the hour of the star. It is also a love story. At least at the midpoint, it becomes a love story because then all of a sudden we have the character of Olimpico, who calls himself a metallurgist. And uh, a little bit later, it becomes a love triangle. So, uh, you know, many, many things going on here in the Hour of the Star. The narrator describes it as the lame adventures of a girl in a city that is entirely against her. So if you want the Hour of the Star in a nutshell, that would be a very nice description to go with it. I would say Maccabea is a loser we cannot help loving. So you have another story that could be described as endearing. And the anti-heroine itself, um, the anti-heroine herself is like that, you know? She is really endearing. You can see this in the movie also, in the movie adaptation. Um, once again, the novella is the anti-epic, and I think The Hour of the Star is one of the best examples of that. Number seven, let's go to China now. Lust Caution by Eileen Chang, uh, novella from 1979. And this is the story that explores the intersection between the personal and the political. Here, the personal is the political, really. It's a story about self-sacrifice, about living for others instead of living for yourself, you know, putting others first, putting the cause first, that kind of a thing. And the setting is Shanghai during the Japanese occupation. The story itself is very simple. You have a student who gets involved with a man who works for the Chinese government that is occupying Shanghai at that moment. This story, the wonderful thing about it, is very short. Um, it's really, you know, local, but at the same time universal. It's really one of those stories that if you change the names and the setting, you could really, this could really be the story of any place during political turmoil. As I was reading it, I thought this could be set in late 1970s Argentina. I relate to that because, you know, that is the background that I come from. I was like, you know, just change the names and, and set it there in Buenos Aires or something like that. And you, it's the same story. It's perfect. So you have a story that transcends the time and the place that it is exploring, right? It begins and it ends with a game of mahjong. You have the sense of ritual here, the sense of the inevitable going on. And something very interesting about it is that the ending, which I'm not going to reveal to you, is not really related, it's not narrated, but it is referred to. Basically what happens is that you find out what the ending is through the thoughts of one of the characters. The ending itself is in the mind of one of the characters here. So it's a really, really amazing technique that Eileen Chang uh, uses in this novella. About the movie, uh, you may have seen it by Ang Lee, right? I would say it's a very good movie, but maybe not a very good adaptation. And this is something that it's not fault, not a fault of the of the movie. It's something that's very common when it comes to novella adaptations, because the cinema, right, film simply for the most part, at least mainstream film, does not really work the way the novella does. So once again, where the novella suggests, you have a movie here that spells out. It shows you too much, you know, and it tells you too much. But it's a very, very good film in itself, and I definitely recommend it. What I say in these cases is that I see the novella as a sketch, right? The novella is kind of an outline. It's, it's the outline of a story, and you have to fill in the blanks yourself. Uh, let's go to France now, um, or to Indochina, actually, because that's where the story takes place. Number eight is The Lover by Marguerite Dura. We have the love affair between a French girl and a Chinese man. But the story, if you ask me, is really about colonialism. 
Okay, so where colonialism is the text, the story of the love affair is the pretext in the case of the lover. It is also a story about social class because you have a French girl who is poor and the Chinese man is the son of a millionaire. So you have social class right there going on. And as in the summer book, you have the exploration of a relationship. It's a very different relationship, of course. It's a love affair, right? But just as in the summer book, this novella, The Lover, is composed of vignettes. So we have this recurring structure right here. There is no story, per se, right? But brief episodes, and sometimes even images, right? That put together a kind of mosaic, once again. It's a cinematic technique, which is hardly surprising, because Dura was also a screenwriter, as you know. So it's um, you know one of those uh, texts that work by accumulation, if you will. It may seem disjointed to you as you read it, because this text is actually based on the logic of memory. Okay, to me as an immigrant, and as you know, immigrants are very, very aware of the permanence of the past in the present. So to me, as I read it, it made perfect sense. The structure was very easy for me to follow. But to some readers, it may seem a little bit disjointed. That is part of the point, right? And uh, the last vignette in the story, I mean, wow, uh, look out for that, because that last part, it, it really, it's really a, a punch. It's so well done, so well written, and so memorable. A uh, great example of what I always say, that the novella is like a pebble thrown into a pond. You just throw that little pebble and the rips, ripples um, keep, you know, uh, expanding. That's exactly what the novella does as a genre. Um, number nine, I have for you The South by Adelaida Garcia Morales. Not a very well-known text in English, okay? At the center of this text, we have an empty space, a black hole, an absence. A woman named Adriana recalls her relationship with her father. This is what El Sur or the South is primarily about. We have just recollections in this case. Like the summer book, like the lover, we have, once again, the exploration of a relationship of a very powerful bond and the novella once again is the ideal genre for this because it doesn't focus on plot so if you really want to develop a story about a relationship or a bond this is the perfect genre to do it in the south we have a series of memories right and we also witness Adriana's awakening as a woman because we see her from the time that she is a little kid up to the time that she becomes a young woman and the father who owns a pendulum, he's a very interesting figure, a very interesting character. He represents magic. He's a sort of wizard figure, whereas the mother represents religion. So you have here this connection between the two uh, parents, these opposites, if you will, in many cases, or, or in many senses. In rare occasions, the novella is going to include a revelation, and the South is one of those cases. It's very rare, but it, it is very well done in this case, and it's very appropriate to the story. This story is going to stay with you. Okay, I can promise you that. Long after you're done reading it, you're going to keep thinking about it. And I wanted to reread it immediately, right after I was done, because I was like, how can such a quote-unquote simple story be so powerful? I really wanted to figure that out. So, you know, I needed to reread the story almost as soon as I was done reading it. There's a film by Victor Erice. I don't know if you've seen The Spirit of the Beehive, one of my favorite movies. If you haven't seen that movie, you have to watch it. It's really, really powerful. But anyway, Victor Erice also adapted um, The South. And a very interesting thing happened there with the adaptation. The director felt that the film was incomplete. But the producer said, this film is complete, forget about it. We're going to release it as it is. I think that has to do with the structure of the novella. You know, sometimes the novella can seem incomplete. There's no conclusiveness to the novella. The story ends, but it doesn't conclude, you know? So I think that's what's going on there with this idea that the film is unfinished, but it is also finished. So that's the South for you. Number 10, let's go to Japan for this one. I have Pregnancy Diary by Yoko Ogawa, which you can find in the collection The Diving Pool, which gathers three novellas for you. As in The Hour of the Star, we have a double story here. Okay, because we have the story of a pregnancy narrated by a girl's, by the girl, the pregnant girl's sister, right? And then we have, at the same time, the story of the narrator's obsession with her sister's pregnancy. So it really is a double story right there. 
The novella is the ideal genre also for a diary story. So if you want to tell a story in the format of a diary, this is the perfect genre for it because the novella is really based on the concept of re-examination of a given situation and that's kind of what you do when you write a diary, right? You're examining something that is already there. So pregnancy diary, great, great concept here. And uh, most of the time you're going to see that the novella includes uh, one single leitmotiv. For example, if you look at Gabriel Garcia Marquez's uh, No One Writes to the Colonel, you have the leitmotif of the heat right there. In this case, in Pregnancy Diary, the leitmotif is food or ingestion. So you do have the pregnancy, but you also have this other thing going on with food right there. There are plenty of sensory details here too, but because of that leitmotif, you know, you have details pertaining particularly to taste and to smell. So it's really, uh, you know, a very, very good text because we get more than the typical visuals, you know. Another thing that uh, Pregnancy Diary features and, and, you know, explores very well is the transcendence of the everyday, right? There are many uh, scenes at the narrator's job, right? There's a point where she visits the dentist, you know, these kinds of mundane things that we all do all the time, but narrated in a way that they seem transcendent, right? So I really like that aspect of Pregnancy Diary. And just so you know, I need to warn you about this. With Ogawa, it, it can get a little bit dark, okay? Um, I mean, not as dark as Hitomi Kanehara, that's for sure, but there's definitely a, a, you know, a dark undercurrent going on right there. This is another novel where the ending, another novella, I'm sorry, where the ending is really important. That last sentence is, is really, really powerful. So, if you want to uh, experience a novel by Ogawa, I highly recommend The Housekeeper and The Professor. It was a classic and it really deserves to be a classic. So, um, you know, this would give you another opportunity to compare the novella and the novel. Pregnancy Diary and The Housekeeper and The Professor. Number 11, The Grandmothers by Doris Lessing. This is a part of a quartet of novellas, actually, also titled The Grandmothers. But when the movie came out, uh, Adore. It was published separately as Adore with the title of the movie. This is a typical editorial move that you may have seen in other cases. For instance, the example that comes to mind right now is Stephen King, you know, uh, The Body, the novella The Body is the movie Stand By Me, so most people know it as Stand By Me by now. And it was also published uh, separately. In the case of The Grandmothers, we have a uh, a really extraordinary situation here because we have two friends, two women who are friends from childhood and they fall in love with each other's sons. Okay, so really, really strange uh, story right here. Uh, it begins at the end, right? So what you see in the first chapter, actually what the novella is going to do is it's going to tell us how things got to that situation, how the characters arrived at the place where they are, they are at right now. And some issues, some themes that we have here are maturity versus immaturity, um, desire versus social convention, which one is going to win, right, of those two, which one is stronger, what you want versus what you're expected to want, you know what I mean? So this is something that is explored in um, The Grandmothers. And the characters themselves Keep this in mind, I think they're not likable characters. I don't think we can speak of likable characters, but you're going to keep thinking about them after the, the novella, after you're done reading it, you know? So it's, it's one of those things, you know? It's just powerful characters, whether you like them or not. The movie is also very good. Adore, I think, is a very good movie. I think it deserves much more attention than it has actually gotten. So I highly recommend it. And I don't think it's one of those movies. I, I think it's probably one of the best adaptations of a novella that I have seen. Once again, you know, Last Caution, I think it shows you too much. The same thing with The Lover, which I did not mention. It's a great film by Jean-Jacques Arnault. It, but, but it shows you too much and it tells you too much when you compare it to the novella. Adore is a little bit different because it's a more artsy movie in, in a way. So, you know, that's something there to, um, to look out for if you decide to watch the movie for The Grandmothers or Adore. And finally, the last one in our journey, number 12, is Disquiet by Julia Lee from 2008. 
a very nice setting we have here a chateau in rural France so you're thinking wow is this idyllic right well, not really things get dark very very quickly in this novella and as in other cases that I've mentioned before we have a double story too we have an evident story and the quote-unquote hidden story here because this is the situation Olivia arrives at this chateau in rural France, which is where her mother lives, with her two children. Right, So we want to find out more about them. Like, why are they there? What, what, what's going on and all of that? But before we get a chance to hear about her, her brother arrives, her brother Marcus arrives with his wife Sophie, who has just given birth to a stillborn child that she still carries around. So you see, it's like the story of Olivia is, is overwhelmed by this new story that we have right here of Sophie, right? So that's what I mean by an evident story, the story of Sophie, and the hidden one, which is Olivia's story right there. Uh, Disquiet is about loss, it's about grief, it's about mourning, right? Very obviously. And I think in this case, we have a novella that is a brilliant example of this. What the novella does not say sometimes is just as important as what it says. I think this is a great example of that. One of the questions that we have is regarding Olivia is where is the husband? Like why is the husband not there? That is part of the hidden story, right? That That is almost forgotten when this other new story and, and more powerful story, you know, uh, sort of intrudes upon the first one and they both become intertwined and, and part of the same thing. There are many Gothic elements in Disquiet, and for that reason, it has been very aptly uh, compared to the work of Ian McEwan, so there are definitely connections right there. And then uh, J.M. Kutsia pointed out that, the, um, that Disquiet has a great influence of film. This is hardly surprising, okay, as, as it tends to be in these cases. Julia Lee is also a filmmaker, okay, and I understand that there's a film adaptation of Disquiet uh, in progress, in development. I would really like to see how this uh, novella translates to uh, film. So, uh, that's the end of our journey. Um, Twelve classic novellas, you know, that everyone should read is my previous video, and when I was putting that one together, I realized that I had left out women writers. I was like, why, how did this happen, right? Because I do like women's literature. I, I love it, actually. And the reason was this. Uh, my favorite novellas written by women simply did not fit into the parameter of the classic, right? Which was up to 1922. It was still unfair. So I thought, you know, um, th th I need to, to remedy this. But in a sense, let me say this. In a sense, I am glad that I left out women from that other list because that allowed me to put together this video and this list that I just shared with you and to focus exclusively on women. I think that is a lot better because I can give you a lot more novellas written by women. And these are actually uh, many of my favorite novellas of all time. So it has really been an absolute pleasure putting this list and this video together and I hope that you enjoyed it too. Do you have any questions, any comments, any thoughts on the novellas that I included? What am I missing, right? I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.